if you've turned to books over summer. Have you found a cracking page turner yet? Here on Weekend Breakfast, we're continuing our focus on authors and storytelling. This morning, we have an exceptional panel of accomplished and acclaimed authors. Australian writer of Afro-Caribbean descent, Maxine Benavet clark is in Charlton, Victoria, and Guru author of Bundjalung Heritage, Melissa Lukashenko in Mwollombar in New South Wales. Welcome to you both. Great to have you here on Weekend Breakfast. Thank you. It's great to be here. Hey, Dan. Uh, Maxine, I want to start with you first. And you last published at the, well, just a couple of months ago, in fact, uh, in fact, with How Decent People Behave. Tell me, what was it like publishing during the pandemic? Oh, I'm sorry, we seem to be having... having to... Hello, can you hear me? Yes, got you. We've got you there. <laughs> Yes, um, yeah, as an author, it was an interesting exercise. You know, I feel like we sometimes struggle with uh, introversion versus having to go to writers' festivals and meet audience members, but it certainly was strange putting this book out during this time, although a lot of the themes of the book have to do with the times that we're in, you know, the pandemic, the Black Lives Matter movement, climate change and things like that. So in that sense, it's felt kind of timely that people have been at home ready to read. Mm. Uh, and Melissa, the last time you published Too Much Lip was just before the pandemic. What's been your observation since then about writing, reflecting, thinking in the way that you have for your previous works? Yeah, um, well, I'm sitting here on Bundjalung country, Dan, and I think uh, the pandemic has upended so much in everybody's lives. And I think it's it's allowed us to do a reset. And one of the tools in that reset is books, because, you know, it's a time of isolation and fear. And what books can do is um, they can be a friend. There's an epidemic of loneliness in the world before COVID. And COVID has just made that even harder for people. You know, capitalism thrives on loneliness. And a book is a, is a great weapon against loneliness. It, uh, you can engage with the world and use your mind in a different way when you find the right book for you. So that's, um, yeah, I think it's, in a way, it's a, it's a reset time. Well, and given that reset, do you think that we're going to see a different style of writing or th that storytelling will be impacted by this as we start to navigate coming out or, or whatever our new normal is? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the most obvious uh, manifestation of that is the numbers of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander writers who are just exploding onto the literary scene, not just here in Australia, but overseas as well. You know, people like Tara June Winch and Adam Thompson and Thomas Mayer with his brilliant book, Dear Son, about Aboriginal fathers and parenting. You know, these kinds of um, uh, really inspiring stories and, and, and joyful stories in a way that can break down that loneliness that capitalism produces. Well, Maxine, I wonder if you might weigh in on that about the impact that you think that COVID might have on storytelling. I absolutely agree with Melissa that, you know, it's, you know, in a sense, there is this epidemic of loneliness and we haven't been able to travel to see our loved ones and things like that over the last two years. But books can travel. You know, I can tell my story, um, you know, on, on Wurundjeri land and it can travel to the United States or to the UK and bring other people into that story. And, you know, as Melissa said, particularly with First Nations writing, and I think with writing also from writers of colour in Australia, the, the publishing industry has suddenly opened up and we're all attached to our televisions 24-7, which, you know, in some senses is, is horrific and in some senses it leads to this incredible sense of globalisation and that we're all part of the same big story. So it's my hope that publishing will continue to open up to voices that are not necessarily always heard in Australian literature. One of the things that, that is one of the clear lines I see in your work, Maxine, in re your recent books is around race relations, racism, institutionally entrenched racism as well. Do you think that that's being looked at and considered differently in the light of the last couple of years, the Black Lives Matter movement, George Floyd, uh, the anniversary here in Australia of the deaths in custody Royal Commission? 
I hope so. I mean, I hope that Australia is able to be um, drawn up, I guess, in the international focus on Black Lives Matter. You know, I did, I suppose, have some concerns during 2020 when I published my picture book, When We Say Black Lives Matter, that perhaps, you know, there wouldn't be a recognition of the horrific things that have happened here on, on Aboriginal land. But I think the great thing about the opening up of that conversation globally is this recognition that this is happening everywhere, um, no matter what black people we're talking about. And so, yeah, I, I see that really, um, you know, the, the increasing of the international conversation and, and making other people aware of what's happening here in the same way that we're becoming more aware of what's happening, whether it be in, in Papua New Guinea or in the United States or in the UK. Mm. Uh, Melissa, what's your perspective on that, on that br the broadening out of the, the conversation? Yeah, it's um, in a way it's it's sad that we have to begin at such a basic level as saying Black Lives Matter because Aboriginal traditional culture begins with the premise that all life matters and that the purpose of life is to sustain life, you know, in all its manifestations. So, you know, climate change should be the the absolute focus of every human on the planet right now. You know, these times have never been seen before, but instead we are distracted by, you know, institutional racism, by police violence, deaths in custody, and of course by COVID, which comes out of climate change. So it, it, racism is a very, very dangerous element in taking away from the sustaining of life and the care that our planet needs at the moment. And, but, you know, Maxine is, is playing her part with her wonderful picture book. All our writers are playing um, the parts that we need to do to say all life is important on planet Earth, but it's black lives that are at most risk right now. You know, if you're a visibly Aboriginal person walking down the street in Australia, especially outside the major cities, you know, you take your life in your hands when you walk out the street half the time. So we need to keep talking about that, but we also need to look past this kind of kindergarten level of um, debate that Australia requires because we're not a mature nation. Mm. You know, you need to look to Aboriginal law and say, how do we work together as communities to sustain life? Yeah, and the crucial conversations that we've started to see more happening of, but but certainly not getting into that uh, resonating, I guess. I asked you both to cast the nets wide to let me know about books that have jumped out at you that uh, perhaps people can put on their reading lists. Uh, and I want to start with you first, Maxine, and, and the first book that you uh, suggested was Sugartown Queens. Tell us about it. The Sugartown Queens is actually a young adult novel. It's written by an Australian writer of South African descent, Mala Nunn. It's a book about a girl in her mid-teens, Amandla. She lives in South Africa in a very kind of black area with her white mother. And it's really the story of how she traces her heritage. She kind of found, finds this bag of money that her mum has brought home. Her mum has serious mental health issues. They live in abject poverty. And it's about her essentially tracing this bag of money back to where she comes from, along with her two friends named Little Bit and Goodness. So it's really this story of kind of the triumph of the sisterhood, as well as it's about roots and class in modern South Africa. So I thought, given that we've all got teens and kids at home that we're trying to stop going out and getting COVID, I'd give some some uh, recommendations for young people. And I love that uh, the character's name of goodness. We could all do with a bit of that, I, I reckon. Uh, and Melissa, to you, The Labyrinth, why did that one stick out for you? Yeah, well, along with Thomas Mayer's book, Dear Son, and uh, Adam Thompson's wonderful Tasmanian stories, uh, Amanda Laurie has also written a Tasmanian book uh, about um, powerful connection but it grows within a, a disconnected community and about a woman. It's, it's a parable of Australia and it's, uh, it's a sensational book and it won the Miles Franklin and so it should have. It's uh, Amanda has her character starting life in an asylum, which I think is just a, a brilliant metaphor for the origins of Australia, this crazy place called modern Australia. Um, and it's about a spirituality and a 
a kind of a quest for belonging that doesn't take away from Aboriginal spirituality. Amanda has done something remarkable in this book. And, uh, you know, if, if you're feeling lonely, if you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling like um, modern life is rubbish, then The Labyrinth or Dear Son could be the books that help you find connection and find solace. Mm. Yeah, and you mentioned some of your other books that you chose there, including Born Into This by Adam Thompson as well. Yeah, yeah Adam's a Pakana man from um, northern Lutrawita, Tasmania, and he's a startling new voice. He's, um, he's a really deep thinker, a quiet man. I like writers who are quiet people, you know, people who can actually stop and consider and pay attention to what's going on in the world. And Adam's worked as a ranger in Lutrawita, Tasmania, for many years uh, and his time on country really comes through in his stories which are uh, a range of diverse voices. He has this great character Uncle Ben who's a kind of anti-hero. He's a, an elder who has a power struggle with a white youth worker when he goes away on a youth camp with him and uh, it's a really intriguing story. It's called The Tin Mine and I recommend you check it out. Yeah, outstanding. Uh, Maxine, you also named uh, two other books, one, Killanova and Bindi. Tell us about both of those. So, yeah, Bindi by uh, Curly Sa Saunders is this incredible book. I actually bought it for my 11-year-old daughter. The protagonist is an 11-year-old Aboriginal girl uh, living on Gundungara, Dun Gundungara country. And um, it's really, you know, I was looking for a book to recommend really for kids for that upper primary school level that engages with our times, the land we're living on, but also is hopeful and this book really, it's about Bindi and her family, her older brother, younger sister, parents. It's about them living on the land, caring for the land, and just a story of childhood, of going to the local pools or the local river and swimming and, you know, your parents kind of ringing from house to house during the summer to find out where you are, of going out and planting trees with her class to kind of revive country, and also the devastating bushfires that sweep the country that Bindi is living on. So it's just this beautiful, it engages with, you know, the hot summer heat of Australia and the bushfires and climate change, but it's just this beautiful story of strong family and childhood and, and ties to the land. Um, and Omar Musa's Killanova, which is a book of poetry. Omar Musa's a Malaysian-Australian poet. Um, his last book, Here Come the Dogs, is a verse novel that was long listed for the Miles Franklin about four or five years ago. And this book is a book of poetry and woodcuts that follows Omar Musa uh, back to Borneo, really, to kind of, I suppose, discover his roots. And I find it really intriguing because it's a, it's a very curious beast in Australian literature in terms of having woodcuts and being an art book, but also having poetry. Um, and he talks about that notion of Borneo being initially one of the most heavily wooded areas in the world and the fact that he's learnt this traditional art of woodcutting to accompany his work. And so it's almost a memoir in poetry and woodcutting. And it's just beautiful and it feels like the perfect kind of summer treat of something that's visual and that's lazy but is also for adults and also contains something profound. I love it. Well, you've both given me uh, plenty of books to pop on to my list. Thank you so much for joining me uh, this morning on Weekend Breakfast. Really wonderful to yarn with you both, Maxine Benneba clark and uh, Melissa Lukashenko. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Well, the